In this program, we meet political figures at the heart of the issues shaping our world. In today's show, I'll be talking to a long-time political activist born under apartheid in South Africa. He has said, the legacy of apartheid is alive and well. The struggle against apartheid, racism, racialism and discrimination has not ended and can never end until a just social order is established. impression I mean because we just heard from the quote there you say the legacy of apartheid is still with us but what has been your impression of the current situation in South Africa since what uh, some describe as so-called liberation the term so-called liberation liberation is quite accurate because uh, nobody has been liberated neither the oppressed people nor the oppressor when you strike a compromise between the oppressor and the oppressed something has gone wrong and that was reflected in what was lauded as a good chance to have reconciliation which was the truth and reconciliation commission ironically 22,000 people turned blacks appeared before the commission and very few of the oppressors um, mm -hmm. the majority of the whites yes what was also very disappointing was the fact that the people who orchestrated the apartheid terrorist regime, not just the apartheid regime, because they terrorized not only the 40 million indigenous people, mm -hmm. but also the surrounding African states. And neither the Bruderbond, which was established in 1918 as a secret organization, was subpoenaed by the TRC, mm -hmm. neither the judiciary, your magistrates, judges, and prosecutors, who implemented the apartheid laws, nor the multinational companies who benefited the most from apartheid. Mm -hmm. And of course, the politicos like uh, ex-president P.W. Buerta, who what, were responsible would, for these. What would, what would you say, Imam, to people who still see people like Nelson Mandela as heroes and see him as a source of inspiration? Do you feel that he was an integral part of the compromise or was he hoodwinked to a certain degree? No, he wasn't hoodwinked. Uh, in his case in 1964, when he appeared in court, he made a statement which was later quoted in the financial uh, mail and other business uh, magazines that he has never ever been opposed to uh, capitalism and that was the cue so they already started trying to get him on board so they softened yeah. him up and that was the reason for removing him from other comrades on the island who were in the Ravonia trial um, accidentally I bumped into uh, the second in command of MK and that's Mkonto Wesizwe Mkonto Wesizwe mm -hmm. and uh, he called me and he mistook me for somebody else for an MK member which I've never been and he said to me uh, Ismail which is not my name if they think they can strike a deal with Nelson Mandela and leave us out they are making a big mistake mm -hmm. so already there was a split which was observable right that they knew that Nelson Mandela had been taken off the island in order to set in process the negotiations. Okay. So that came as no surprise. Well, l looking at the current administration under Zuma, would you say that is a continuation of the same line of thinking? No, there's a big difference uh, between Zuma. Zuma was on Robben Island for 10 years. Nelson Mandela was there for 18 years. And we'd just like to correct an historical error which says that he was on Robben Island for 27 years. That's mm -hmm. not true. The oldest serving political prisoner on Robben Island was, in fact, Jeff Masimula, who spent 27 years there. And he was, in fact, assassinated in what was called the motor car accident shortly after he was released. 
So he definitely was the longest uh, serving prisoner on Robben Island. And he was a member of the Pan-Africanist Congress that, of Azania, yes? That is yes? correct, a very staunch member okay. who had received life imprisonment way back in 1963. Right. So. Nelson Mandela obviously uh, was the key to bringing about the changes and a lot of the deals that took place both in Lusaka and London were directly uh, related to him and involved him. When I was in Polsma prison uh, way back in the 80s, that would have been around about 86, I was arrested and held in detention. Uh, we saw Nelson Mandela leaving the prison complex dressed in a suit and of course later on we discovered that these meetings were with Kwebi Kutsi, um, one of the cabinet ministers. Mm -hmm. So obviously later on they confirmed that and even meetings with the head of intelligence, Dr. Neil Barnard and others. Mm -hmm. So it was a long process which started way back in 1982 and uh, of course you had the Dakar conference and other feelers that were sent out. Yeah. But it was very well orchestrated. Yes. Um, the people who needed the settlement badly were, in fact, the multinational companies, the financiers, the banks, the investors, mm -hmm. because the country obviously was going down a very slippery economic slope. Mm -hmm. uh, they got them on board. Why did they choose the ANCs? Because the ANC has always been very comfortable with the concept of multi racism. And I found it ironical that even Nelson Mandela, uh, on two occasions, one is a set of uh, essays written by Robben Island prisoners and edited by Mac Maharaj called Reflections uh, from Robben Island. And the first essay is by Nelson Mandela. Mm -hmm. And in there he still refers to people as colors and as blacks and Africans. Mm -hmm. Um, when he was at Wembley shortly after his release, he says the ANC is a non-racial organization, therefore all races are welcome. Right. Now, that obviously is conceptual confusion. Mm -hmm. uh, many of our top thinkers in South Africa, when they say, when we called ourselves Africans, we meant that we were anti-racist. And right. very few people have used the concept anti-racism we also draw a distinction between racism and racialism. Mm -hmm. Racism is based on statutes, on law, and it's enforced by the police, the courts, and eventually the army. Whereas racialism is when you and I discriminate against each other on whatever flimsy reason. And the fact that it is still very much part of South African life is the BEE, Black Economic Empowerment, and Affirmative Action and also the outbreaks of xenophobia just consolidates that particular viewpoint that racism and racialism is alive and well in South Africa. Well, for a lot of people, um, the Pan-Africanist Congress of Azania is little known as a political entity. Yes. But everything you are articulating is very much in tune uh, with what they say as well, because you, uh, once upon a time you were a member, yes. and it was led by Robert Mangaliso Sobukwe, who is almost written out of the history of South yes. Africa. Now, I'd like to ask you, what has happened to the PAC and that element of political thinking within South Africa now? You are quite right. Uh, Robert Subukwe was on Roman Island. He was held there for six years, and he was the only prisoner in the world who was held on Robben Island as a political prisoner due to a law passed in Parliament just for him. Yeah. And it's known as the Subukwe Clause. And every year they had to renew his detention, and they had a very good reason because they compared him to the late Albert Luthuli, Chief Albert Luthuli, and said, why couldn't you just ban Subukwe, but release him from Robben Island? And the then uh, Minister of Justice said, it's like comparing a heavyweight boxer with a flyweight boxer. Hmm. Subukwe had a lot of clout, and his most important clout was intel intellectual. And that sadly, that heritage has not been very well looked after because what is now called, people called coloreds 
he rejected and said those who are called Khalids are in fact indigenous Africans because they're descendant from mothers or fathers who were indigenous. Uh, and if I could interrupt you a little bit, uh, um, he is the only African who I've heard defining uh, an African not by the color of their skin or even by their heritage but yes. by their love of the motherland Africa and he saw that as the only way to resolve the contradictions to do with racial heritage within South Africa did you agree with that yes I fully agree with that yeah. that is why I eventually joined the PSC I was fortunate enough to serve for some period as chairman of the Western Cape Mm -hmm. and subsequently as National Secretary General. Uh, of course I have now left because obviously uh, a lot of infighting and splinter groups arose and most important of all the PAC couldn't get two things right. One was to have a sustainable uh, financial uh, backing and the second one was a lack of a proper administrative structure. So based on that, they were not going to go anywhere. No. But they would have been opposed in any case by all the imperialist and neo-colonialist powers in the world and on the African continent because the national problem is essentially the regaining, the repossession of the land which was taken from the African people. So today as we are talking here, there is a clause in the Constitution, in fact in the Bill of Rights, it's clause 25 which says that no land will exchange hand except through due process of law uh, which meant uh, you've got to wait until they decide on this idea of willing buyer willing seller which they tried in Zimbabwe okay and well and this this brings me up to another issue I'd really like to discuss with you in some depth it is to do with another land question uh, the situation of Palestine yes. and you have said that the legacy of apartheid is very similar to the existence of Zionism could you tell us why this analogy is so strong in your mind yeah uh, perhaps you've got my quote wrong because I don't see similarities because Zionism is a thousand times worse than apartheid. So we are not so much interested in the similarities but in the dissimilarities. In mm -hmm. all the years that we were under the colonial rulers from 1652 until the apartheid regime took power in 1948, uh, we have never ever had an African township bombed with F-16 fighters. We have never had massacres on the scale that have taken place uh, in occupied Palestine. And when I say occupied Palestine, I mean the entirety of Israel that was established in 1947 and also the subsequent conquest 1967 and the expansion, uh, taking away of East Jerusalem, the West Bank, etc. Um, it is definitely worse because none of the Afrikaners in South Africa ever believed that God gave them that land whereas the Zionists are saying that the only title deeds they have to the land of Palestine is the Bible. So that makes it worse. And my understanding of history as well is before they decided upon Palestine, yes. they were considering a certain part of Africa as the homeland for the Uganda, Jews. Uganda, to be precise. Yes. Yeah. Okay. But uh, it's good to share platforms with the rabbis of the Neturei Karta because they don't believe that Israel has a right to exist and that no Jew has the right to take land belonging to another people. So it is this lie that there will be land, uh, people without land, right, mm -hmm. uh, taking land without people. But that was not true. When the last British census was held in uh, then the Palestinian mandate, they actually discovered that only 10% of the population were classified Jews. And this indicates that here was a land grab of massive proportions accompanied by what can only be described as genocide. We don't buy into this idea that only Rwanda Burundi had a genocide. Uh, they even refused to recognize the one in Bosnia Herzegovina. But they glorify the Holocaust as if it's the Holocaust with a definite article in front. In other words, there's only one Holocaust that took place. But if Holocaust means to eradicate the whole or part of a population, 
especially the civilian population, through deliberate, systematic extermination, then I would say the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki also counts as a holocaust. Because here were hundreds of thousands of Japanese who were killed on the 6th and the 9th of August 1945, and they were not only exterminated, they were incinerated, they were ob obliterated and cremated at yeah. the same time within a couple of seconds. Now that is a genuine holocaust. People were consumed by fire. Okay, do you feel a lot of the points of view you are articulating, some might call as extremely radical or leftist, whatever term they want to use. Yes. Do you feel that in the course of time, everything you are articulating will actually be common knowledge, as some of the things you've said about South Africa um, since so-called liberation is now common knowledge and understood by a lot of people. Do you feel in the course of time similar things will be thought about the existing state of Israel? Yes, most definitely. Uh, the fact that there is a big clash within Israel between the Orthodox Jews and the Zionist. Theodor Herzl said that Zionism must remain secular. He wrote a letter to Cecil John Rhodes in 1902 and he said, I need to speak to you because your project, which meant the colonization of southern and northern Rhodesia at the time, uh, that was 1896, are both colonial projects. Now there you have it out of the horse's mouth, the father of Zionism. So the rabbis, orthodox rabbis in the Netura Carta, they endorsed that point of view, that Israel should never exist. And you can't punish, uh, through collective guilt, Palestinians who had nothing to do with the Nazi Holocaust. And it was not only the Jews who were killed in Germany. What Hitler did, he first wiped out the opposition. The communists and anybody else who opposed him, the intellectuals, the artists. And after he had finished them off, then he went for the Jews. And this is a feature of all genocidal activities, that you want a free reign to operate as you please. And somebody benefits from a Holocaust and from a genocide. And it's normally the ruling classes, right. because this is almost a primitive means of capital accumulation. I take what you have and make it mine, okay. whether it's land or whether it's minerals, whatever it is. <laughs> because you, you talk implicitly and explicitly about a more just social order yes. and and as someone who's lived under apartheid how do you see pan-africanism or the idea of a unified uh, africa because kwame nkrumah who was the president of the first independent african state ghana mm -hmm. said his country's independence was meaningless mm -hmm. without the independence of every single other african nation is that a pipe dream do you feel no, it isn't. He expressed it very well. He says, unless every square inch of Africa is liberated. Ahmed bin Bala, the first president after the success of the Algerian revolution, said exactly the same, that the liberation of Algeria is meaningless unless we're going to liberate the rest of Africa. Now, Pan-Africanism also is not just a continental uh, concept. It also includes the people in the diaspora. Just last night, there was a documentary on uh, the slave trade in, for example, Jamaica. Look at the visuals coming through television now on Haiti. I never imagined that people could still be living in such poverty right on the doorstep of Miami. Right? So who is responsible for keeping the poor dispossessed, ignorant, diseased, and discriminated against? And I think, yes, a new social order is possible. As one of the other Robin, uh, former Robben Island prisoners said uh, throughout his whole life, he died on Boxing Day, the 26th of December last year, mm -hmm. as Professor Dennis Brutus. And he persisted in the idea that an alternative world is possible and definitely an alternative economic, social, uh, economic order must be the prerequisite for that. In well, the, the first criticism people might raise when you make that statement is that the alternative to capitalism, what was defined as socialism in the USSR, former USSR, yeah. has been seen to be a complete failure. Um, what would you say to that statement? What is socialism in the 21st century? 
Yes. The, the fact that the Soviet Union was established, <coughs> excuse me, and maintained through terror under Stalin, bearing in mind the conditions under which he had to operate, and also during the Second World War when Hitler actually attacked the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union more than survived because you can't pull a society from a semi-feudal state into the 1950s and compete with space exploration and nuclear weapons, etc., if something significant had not happened. Where there is a difference of opinion is the fact that when we talk about nationalization, it's not the same as socialization. Because in South Africa, we had a lot of things nationalized, but the bulk of the people did not benefit from it. Whereas when you socialize the land and you socialize the economic system, especially health system and the educational system, it means that the people themselves are in control of the process and they decide what is beneficial or non-beneficial for themselves. And nobody can reverse that. Whereas if you nationalize, even through legislation especially, you can reverse that at the stroke of the pen. And that is not what we want. Also people must determine what are their needs and what are their wants. What is it that the African people need at this moment? They need an overdose of education, but that is not going to come about if we don't even have a philosophy of education. We don't have enough qualified teachers. So we've had almost, what, five uh, ministers of education, and none of them have been able to reverse the trend. And for one and one reason only, they don't seem to understand that the primary purpose of education is to teach human beings how to live with other human beings. That was the greatest failure of apartheid. Yeah. And they failed because apartheid as a system was based on irrationality. Well, let's go to a much more rational kind of thinking, which may answer that question that you've posed. Spiritualism is something Africa is not short of. We have people who are passionate Christians, passionate Muslims, passionate animists, but very passionate about their spiritual heritage. How do you see a resolution, a kind of unification, if you like, of thinking around spiritual thought within Africa? Because all the Western media predominantly tells us is that Muslims and Christians will forever be fighting. Yeah, it's, it's a blatant lie. It serves the interest to pitch the, on the basis of divide and rule, to put one group another against another, one tribe against another, and they reap the benefits. And this has been happening since the oppressors set foot in Africa. Just look at the division that they caused from 1884 onwards. And prior to that, from 1432, with the advent of the African slave trade, they first had to dehumanize Africans by saying they are heathens, they are backwards, they are barbarians, etc. So once you've dehumanized the people, then the next stage is you can safely eliminate them yeah. and having a clear conscience. A slave trade endured for 400 years. And in that period, according to Basil Davidson, he says in a book called Black Mother, approximately and conservatively 100 million Africans were taken off the African continent. Now, when you take a slave, you normally choose the best, the strongest, the fittest, the most fertile. And that is how we land up with these magnificent specimens in the, what is called the New World. Yes. Right? The yes. descendants of uh, uh, Hussein, Hussein, Hussein Bolt. Bolt. Yes. What, what a yeah. magnificent specimen of yeah. humanity. They even call him an alien <laughs> because yeah. there's nobody on planet Earth that runs as fast as he is as. But all of this indicates that s slavery destroyed and ravaged large sectors of the African population, both in South Africa, where slavery only ended on the 1st of December, 1832. Uh, Angola has a terrible history of slavery, massacres, Mozambique, uh, the West Coast, the Gold Coast, as they used to call it. And we can't undo that, but at least there should be reparations for that. And that is something that needs to get into the international uh, arena.
But what would you say to a young person? Because new, new young souls are being born every second that we, we're mm -hmm. speaking. A young African who is looking forward to the future. I mean, what would you say to them in terms of the hopes and dreams that you would like to see within your lifetime? What kind of inspiration perhaps could the Quran give or mm -hmm. the Bible or any kind of spiritual thinking to help young people live lives that are of benefit to all? Yeah. It's a very important question. Just a few days ago, one elderly uh, retired principal said to me, you know, in the pre-Islamic era, and then I said, just wait a minute, when was that? W when was God born? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then mm -hmm. she understood yeah. that there's been yeah. no period in man's life that can be called pre-Islamic, because they think Islam started with the birth of the Prophet or with the revelation of the Quran. But then the Quran yeah. itself says that Abraham and Moses and Jesus were all Muslims. They submitted to the will of God. So that is why I'm saying there is no necessity for Muslims, Jews and Christians to be fighting each other. They should be understanding what the revelation is about. Yes. And there's a, a very important principle which says that if you kill one innocent person, it's as if you've killed the whole of humanity. And if you save the life of one innocent person, it's as if you've saved the whole of humanity. And the Prophet Muhammad actually endorsed that very beautifully by saying that the best human being is the one who is most beneficial to humanity. Now, when we talk about a just social order, we mean one in which uh, you are neither an oppressor nor oppressed. Mm -hmm. Now, doesn't that sound good? Mm -hmm. And it's a society in which every human being, citizen or non-citizen, has at least one meal per day, Understood. even if it means free of charge, okay. prepared by the state. Well, and on that positive note, and I don't think any religion or religious teaching would disagree with that. Of course not. Thank you so much. <laughs>